Great. Um, welcome back to CSE 373, 548, Analysis of Algorithms, Lecture 4. Um, are there any questions before we get started about bureaucratic matters, the homeworks, or things like that? Anything that comes to mind? Yes. Yes, I, yes, the lecture notes are now supposedly available in basics. I got a phone, I spoke with the guy this morning. He says that, that um, the lecture notes are there, that the packet will cost $18, and that will contain the entire year's worth of lecture notes from the last time I taught the course. And the notes correspond reasonably closely, but not exactly to what I did last time. So if you're looking for some way to sort of take notes in class and you're saying, gee, wouldn't it be great if I had the lecture slides in advance? You're better off investing in those notes, okay, and using them. These notes will be available after class in the library, okay. We had a student, uh, Jersey, who, who uh, graciously agreed to walk these things over to the CS library every day. So the new notes will be in the CS library. The new notes will be on the web page. The old notes will be available in basics, okay, if you are uh, interested in, in having something to, to jot things down on when you're in lecture. Okay, and the choice is up to you. Those are all the possible options you can have. Okay? Any other questions about notes or anything like that? Will the webpage notes be there before the class? Um, if they'll be there, they'll be mi there microseconds before the, the class starts. So not, 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 don't, don't count on it, and, and certainly not early enough to, for you to do anything with them. So uh, I prepare the, the prepare for the class right up to the moment lecture starts. So there's not much, much time there. Okay, any other questions about... Um, Anything. Okay, let's start again. We have the problem of the day. There are two problems for today. Um, and they both have to do with working on recurrence relations, which is what we talked about last class. The first problem said, argue that the solution to the recurrence relation Tn equals Tn over 3 plus 2Tn over 3 plus n is okay, um, omega uh, of um, n log n. That means that, okay, it is um, at least as big. This is sort of the lower bound, okay, argument, okay? And it gives you a hint that you want to prove this by appealing to the decision trip. So when you ask, how would I go about trying to solve this problem, I would take them on their word and say, build the decision trip. So what does the decision tree for uh, the recursion tree, excuse me, for this kind of a recurrence relation look like? Well, it looks something like this. You start out with a call to Tn. In the course of executing that, it gets broken into a call to Tn over 3 and another call of Tn, T2n over 3. Okay. In evaluating what T of n over 3 is, that gets broken into a third of that, which is n over 3 over 3 or n over 9 one of which is two-thirds of that, which is t, you know, basically two-thirds of one-third, which is two, two-ninths, okay? And um, on this side, we started out with two-thirds. The, in some sense, light side of the recursion took one-third of the remaining stuff. That left me with two n over th nine stuff there. The heavy side of the recurrence was two-thirds of this, so two-thirds of two-thirds is four n over nine. Okay, and that's the start of our rec recursion tree. And what makes this one a little different than the ones we talked about in class is the, the amount of stuff at each, at each um, point is different. Okay, each node has a different amount of stuff, which makes it, it's not regular. Okay. The other part of the decision tree that we've talked about is how much actually gets added. We remember what that recurrence looked like. Okay, the important thing was that there was an additive factor of n there. So the amount of stuff that gets added is going to be the size of the argument, n, n over 3, 2n over 3, okay, 2, 2n over 9, 2n over 9, 4n over 9. So what's interesting about that? Well, if you take a look at the, re the recursion tree, the additive stuff, looks like good things are happening. Because if you add up each row, each row is adding up to exactly n, okay? That's 1 ninth plus 2 ninths, that's 3 ninths, 3 ninths plus that is 2 ninths is 5 ninths, 5 ninths plus 4 ninths, 9 ninths, that's n. Every level adds up to n. So that's the kind of thing we want to see. That's easy to work with. If you want to prove that the sum of this thing, this recurrence value, is at least as big as n log n, 
What we need to now do is make some kind of a study of the levels, how many levels there are in the tray. Okay, and this is a little bit more complicated than the other ones we've seen because the size of the arguments isn't actually uniform. So how many levels does this, this, this recursion tree have? My claim is the number of levels is going to be the length of the longest path from the root to the bottom. Okay. Where is the longest path in our recursion tree coming from? Okay. Well, if we think about it, our, our path ends when the amount of the argument, the amount of stuff that we have is down to one unit. Okay. And if we remember looking at this non-uniform tree, there was sort of heavy branches and light branches, depending upon whether we went down the two-thirds side or the one-third side. Okay? The shortest branch in the decision tree is going to, path is going to be the one that gets to one quickest, which means that we're dividing the most stuff out of it each time. Which means that if we follow the branch where each time we divide by a third, okay, and I realize that I guess isn't readable from there, but so the lightest branch, the path that will get down to one as quickly as possible, is where we divide it by the, multiply it by the smallest fraction. Okay. The path that takes the longest time to get down to one is going to be the path where we always multiply it by the largest fraction. Okay. In this case, two thirds. So what does that tell us about the the height and the tree, the height, the height of the tree? The shortest path to the leap is when we take the, um, the, the uh, branch where we only take a third of it each time. Okay? The height to that point is going to be how many times can we take n, multiply it by a third, till we get down to 1. Okay? And that simply turns out to be the log base 3, ha base three of the number of the amount n we started with. If you want to think about what the longest path is, that's where we start out with n units, keep dividing it by two thirds, multiplying it by two thirds until we get down to one. Okay? We want to know how many times do we raise two thirds to k to get it down to that. That's the answer, which means the height is going to be the log base two, three halves. The three halves comes from the fact that we flip things around. Okay? Okay? Of n. So that gives us the the tallest and longest paths to leaves in the tray. What did the problem ask? The problem asked that we want to show a lower bound, meaning we want to come up with an argument saying that the amount of stuff that we add is going to have to be at least n log n, okay, or some constant times that. Well, we know that every single level, on a full level, the additive terms are going to be n. If I can show that there are theta of log n levels that are full, then that many levels times n is going to be a lower bound on the total sum. Okay? Well, how many levels are there that are full? The shortest path is going to be the, the log, log base 3 of n. That means that every p level before that has to be full, because we couldn't have had any leaves yet. So we've got a full tree, each level of, uh, of, of height at least that, each of which level sums up the n. Thus, the size of our value is at least n times that amount, which is at least n log n. <coughs> okay, any questions about how I did this one? Okay. Again, once you draw the recursion tree and look at it and think of things in terms of the recursion tree, it becomes relatively easy. When you start trying to look at formulas and plug things in, then you're in trouble. Okay, it makes sense once you have the recursion tree. Any questions about this one? Okay. Very good. The second one, the second problem of the day, asked for a, you to use um, iteration to solve a recurrence relation okay, when, um, when you, know, you had some constant a that's greater than 1. Okay? And the recurrence relation they wanted you to solve was this one. t of n equals t of n minus a plus t a plus a. <coughs> And when they say they want you to use iteration, iteration is what I call back substitution. There shouldn't be any confusion about that. So how would I solve what this recurrence relation is? The idea of back substitution is you keep sticking the recurrence in for itself okay, until you start to notice a pattern. Okay? And then try to figure out what the pattern actually is. 
So what happens? What is T of n? It's going to be, well, T of a is a constant. So that's sort of the base. We can't make that any smaller. That's n. The thing that we have to back substitute for is this T of n minus a term. Well, what is T of n minus a? T of n minus a is going to be T of n minus a minus a, or n minus 2a, plus T a plus the residue, which was n minus a. Do I notice a pattern? Well, maybe not yet. So let me go stick it in again. What is t of n minus a going to be? N, n minus 2a? Well, it's going to be t of n minus 3a plus another da plus another n minus um, 2a. And when I start looking at this thing and collecting terms, it should sort of be seem clear what's happening. At least it sort of became clear to me. Each time what's happening to this argument, OK? It's getting chopped down by a factor of a each time. Okay, it starts out at n, and each time I do a substitution, this argument is getting smaller by, a, by, by an additive term of a. So how many times would I have to keep substituting that till this part of the expression went completely away? Okay, it starts out with a value of n. How many times would I have to keep substituting it till this term sort of vaporized, became a constant? Yes? About n over a times. About n over a times. Because if I'm topping off a value of a each time, n over a times a is n. Okay? So I know that really what's happening, the substitution is going to happen n over a times. That's the first observation. What happens each time I do that substitution? Well, I'm leaving behind a residue of this TA, okay? And I'm leaving away a sum term which is n minus, when I do the i-th substitution, n minus i times a. OK? And once you see that, that then gives you a way to sort of think what the formula has to be. There's going to be about n over a terms. Let's zoom in now a little bit. There's going to be about n over a terms that get lumped, dumped behind, leaving t a. OK? And there's going to be n over a times I'm going to substitute, leaving an argument of n minus i times a. On the i-th substitution, I leave i times a. So the problem reduces to solving this. And this isn't so bad. What's t a times this sum? Well, t a has nothing to do with the index. We pull that thing out. It's a sum of 1 as we go from n over a. n over a times that, that's easy. OK, that's finished. What's this sum? Well, we've got a sum of two terms, one of which depends upon the index, one of which doesn't. Let's break it into two sums. The thing that doesn't depend upon the index, we factor that thing out. And again, it's going to be n over a times a. The thing that does depend upon it, well, the a doesn't. We can factor that out. But we're reduced to what is the sum as i goes from 0 to n over a of i. Well, you should know what the sum of it, sort of an atom additive series is. Okay, This is sort of one of the big summations. We've already used it. That the sum of the numbers from 1 to n grows something like n squared. Okay, specifically it grows n, it's n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, and so you, when you just simply use this formula and plug that thing in, you get that term. And this is about what the answer is. And this is as close to being the exact answer as I feel I need to know. Okay? So by plugging it in and working from it on a straightforward basis, seeing what the answer was, okay, it became easy to actually figure that thing out. Any questions about how I did that or any of these general things? Oh, I could probably combine these things or mumble on that. But I mean, I'm then at this point, I'm down to what is the, Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Maybe. Yeah. That's ah, good. there we go. OK. This is the last line I wanted to show, that somehow the sum came down to this. I have no TNs. All I have left are TAs and functions of n and a. And now how you express that's a function of how you, you know, your algebra. That's fair. Any questions? OK. So. Again, once you get the hang of it, it isn't, you know, th these kind of things aren't so bad. We're not going to spend a lot of time the rest of the semester talking about recursions and how to solve them, okay? So now I'm going to assume that this is somehow a technology that you all know and have mastered, okay? But, um, but uh, now we'll start to get into some, maybe some things that are more related to actually algorithms in general, okay? Real algorithms, the computer science kind of thing. So I'd like to start off talking about the next section by introducing what I think students consider the, the biggest open problem in computer science. Namely, 
why is it that computer science professors won't stop talking about sorting? Okay, if you've taken a typical computer science program, probably in your first programming course, you wrote a, a, a sorting implementation. And probably when you took your data structures class, they went through a zillion sorting algorithms. And now I'm going to go to the algorithms class, and I'm going to go through a zillion sorting algorithms in the next couple classes. Why is it? Why, don't, why, why this excess? Why is it that computer science people love to talk about sorting? And there turn out to be sort of three main reasons, or at least three, three reasons why I'll sort of talk about it. The first reason is it's not that if you had to pick one thing that computers do in sort of business applications or non-numerical kinds of applications, it's clear they spend more time sorting than anything else. You would read in a book that somehow mainframes would spend 20, historically spent 25% of their CPU cycles sorting things. I don't know if I really believe that or not, okay? But it's clear that it's a very important thing. It's the most important kind of algorithm problem there is. The second thing is that sorting is a completely well-studied problem, okay? Algorithms, people have studied sorting algorithms since probably the first real sorting algorithm was merge sort developed by um, John von Neumann, okay, back in like 1945. And since then, people have tried hundreds of different sort, have invented easily dozens of different sorting algorithms, okay, and analyzed them. And there's usually some reason why one particular algorithm is going to be better than something else in, another, in a particular situation. And trying to analyze where that is is really where the whole field of algorithm analysis came from. So because it's so well studied, okay, is a good reason to sort of look into it, because a lot of people have thought about it. The main reason why we will look at it, okay, is that most of the interesting ideas that come up in algorithm analysis, be it randomization, divide and conquer, okay, use of data structures, okay, lower bounds. All these kind of ideas end up arising in the context of sorting. Okay, and I think we'll sort of use sorting as a methodology to sort of explain some of these ideas. I'll assume that most of you have seen most of these algorithms at some point, okay, in some level. Mostly what we're going to concentrate um, in the next couple, several lectures when we talk about sorting is going to be trying to concentrate on analysis, which I suspect people have not seen done as rigorously or why the, why the analysis works, and use this as a, as a case study for how you analyze algorithms. Any questions about sorting? Why sorting is a good thing? Well, another reason why sorting is something that um, we are very interested in when we talk about algorithms is that Sorting is a fundamental building block to a lot of more complicated algorithmic problems. Okay? If you're sitting on an exam, you're, you're, you look at a problem, you're absolutely stumped. Okay? What should you do? Asking yourself the question is, can I sort something? Okay? And will it help me? Is a good way to get untracked. There's a tremendous number of things you can do once you sorted something. Okay? And that's why sorting tends to be a building block that we're going to build a lot of other algorithms on. So for example, what can you do if you sort something? Well, one thing you can do, and probably the biggest reason why people sort something, has to do with searching. If you have a sorted data structure, like the telephone book I dismembered a few lectures ago, okay, um, you can use a binary search to enable you to find any item in that, 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 that telephone book or dictionary in log n time, which is extremely fast. Okay? And so, the biggest reason why people sort things is to speed up sort of queries about uh, sort of lo location queries. Where is this item or, or, or does this item exist in this data structure? Okay? So that's one application of sorting. Another thing you can do with sorting, once you have it, is solve the closest pair problem. What is the closest pair problem? Suppose I give you n numbers, okay? And I ask which pair of numbers is closest to each other. Okay? How could you do that? One thing you could do is, by closest, I mean closest to numerical value. One thing you could do is take every number and compare it to every other number. So if you have n numbers, you could do n squared comparisons, saying what's the difference, what's the absolute value of these differences? If it's smaller than anything I've seen before, keep it. That would be an n squared algorithm to find the closest pair uh, between two numbers. But we can sort faster than that. And with sorting, we can solve closest pair faster than that. Why? Sort all the numbers. Once the numbers are sorted, one thing you know is that the two numbers whose values are closest to each other are going to lie next to each other in sorted order. 
You can't have number 5, 10, and 15. 5 and 15 can't be the closest pair because there's some number in between that's going to make that's going to define something even closer. So once you sort the numbers, the closest pair is going to be next to each other. And just sweeping from left to right, checking each number compared to its neighbor in sorted order. In sorting plus linear time, we can find the closest pair, okay? which is faster than the other way of doing it, and is easy once you believe sorting can be done easily. Any question about closest pair? Okay, Easy application of sort. What's another application of sorting? Suppose I give you n items. Okay, be they, let's say, names. Okay, maybe names in a mailing list. Okay, and you'd like to tell whether or not there's any duplicates. I don't know if any of you have gotten trapped on a mailing list more than once, and you start getting, you know, an infinite amount of junk mail barged to you. What they would like to do is go through the list of names and prune out any duplicates. Well, what's the way to tell if there's any duplicates? You could take every name and compare it to every other name. That's n squared. Or, much better, sort all the names. Okay, if they are, um, you know, if there's any name that's not unique, it's the two copies of it are going to appear next to each other in sorted order. So again, a linear sweep plus sorting enables you to identify if there are any duplicates, and if so, prune them out. Okay, more efficient than comparing anything else. Suppose, let's say, you want to compute the mode of a set of data. What was the mode? If you remember your statistics, the mode was the item that occurred most frequently. Okay, that was the mode of a, of a set of items. How do you compute the mode? Okay, using sorting. Any ideas? How do you find the number that comes up the most? Basically, you sort all the numbers. All identical items are going to be next to each other. Now the problem consists of walking through your sorted array. Okay. Every time the, the, you, know, you, 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 you see where a, an item changes, let's say when you sort it, it's 1, 1, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. You keep track of where were the positions where in the sorted array things change, the indices where they change. The biggest difference between these indices is going to be defining the mode. Again, once you sort the items in linear time, a linear sweep through it will compute the mode, okay, the most frequent item. How would you find the median of a set of items? I give you n items. A median is the one that has the same number of items below it in order, sorted order than as below, above it in sorted order. Well, that I pretty much just gave you the answer. That's the definition. Okay? You sort the n items, stick them in an array, see which item is in the n over second position. That's got to be the median because half the items are less and half the items are bigger. So using sorting, you solve median in a trivial way. Okay? There's lots and lots of these kind of problems, little problems that come up, maybe not as big applications, but as problems that arise in other problems. And all of these can be solved easily using sorting. That's why we're going to care a lot about sorting. Okay? Any questions about any of these problems, why those algorithms work? Okay. Yes, question. Is the median always one of the numbers? You have an the median in the number of Right. The question is, is the median always one of the numbers? By definition, the median is an element that has half the numbers smaller and half the numbers bigger. The mean is the average. No, no. I mean, if you just, those halves normally should be equally big. So if you have 16 numbers, um, you can only have 7 on 1 and 8 on oh, 1. Oh, OK. Then there's a question. The question is, what happens if you have an even number of numbers? OK. And then it depends upon how you want to define median. If you want to take the one that's, you know, sort of, if you have four numbers, is the median the one that's in the second position or the third position or the average of the two? Yeah. Okay. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't care. For any of them, whichever one you want to do, you can find it by sorting. And then now you've got those two elements there, you can do what you want with them. Okay. Okay. So that's not a problem. Okay. Sorting's the way to do it. Uh, Question. You, if, uh, for example, we have uh, array one, two, three, four, 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 five. Okay, let me write that down. Uh, what was the, okay, so the question is, we have an array. The array is about, has... Okay, so let's see if we can find a pen that does it. One, two, three, four. Yes? 
And you want to know what's the median? Yeah, what's the median? The median is the one by definition that's in the middle. Okay. Four has just one number above and three below. Well, but usually, I mean, the fact that it, 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 it depends upon what the interpretation of what you want to do. When I think of the median, I think of you, it, it, it depends on all the numbers in your set. Okay. If you're saying you don't want multiple copies in your set, run that algorithm I gave you using sorting to eliminate all duplicates. Okay, and then take the median your way. So if you want to compute your kind of median, that's fine. You can do it with sorting. Okay? Again, sorting is really the building block that you're building these things around. Okay? And that's, that's sort of the important thing here. If you want to do something slightly different than what I want to tell you, that's fine. Odds are sorting will still do the job. Any questions about these? Okay? It's good to actually go back and review those applications, make sure you see them, because they're such building blocks of other kinds of data structures and algorithms. Okay? Let's look at some other applications of sorting, okay? Because I want to really sort of motivate this because sorting is the ideas that we're going to be using as a building block for so many to solve so many other things. In fact, maybe the most important thing to know about sorting in this class is the idea that you can use it to build other things. So what's another thing? Well, there's a problem that turns out to be very important in computational geometry and pattern recognition and lots of different things called finding the convex hull of a set of points. What is a convex hull? Well, if I give you a set of points in two dimensions, namely these um, black dots, the convex hull is the smallest area polygon that contains all the points, namely this black thing around there. Okay? If you want to think about it in less technical terms, if these points were nails banged into a piece of wood with the head sticking out, and you stretched a rubber band over the points and let go, the place where the rubber band would kachung into position is the um, convex hull. Now, why would we care about these things? Well, convex hulls turn out to be the basic building block of geometric problems. In some sense, the, the convex hull gives you some kind of a rough idea of what the shape of the point sets are. Okay? And it turns out that you can use convex hulls to build lots of other things. Okay? But why do we care about convex hulls, or what does convex hulls have to do with sorting? Given a set of points, how would you find the convex hull? Okay? Suppose I give you another point, let's say this one here, okay? and add that to the set. Does that change the convex hull? No. Does this one? No, because it's inside. What about this one? Okay. Well, yes, this one does. Because now I would have to sort of extend it to here and delete these kind of things. So how could you find the convex hull? I don't want to go through the real details of the algorithm. But now it's sort of an algorithm should kind of make sense. One by one, insert the points. Okay? And then when it's going to change the hull, okay, update things. Correct? But the first part of your problem, the part that would make this very messy, is trying to figure out whether your points lie inside or outside the hull to start with. Okay? How can we avoid that problem to begin with? Suppose we start out with all of our points and sort them according to their x coordinate. And just one by one insert the points in the order of their x coordinate. Okay? So for example, we start out, this is the convex hull. Let's try with a uh, blue pen. We then insert the next point, which is that that's the convex hull. Insert the next leftmost point. Insert the next leftmost rightmost point. Next rightmost. Next rightmost. One thing that we're guaranteed if we sort these things according to their x coordinate, every new point we add is going to have to be outside the hull. Okay? Because it's further to the right of anything we've already stuck in there. And by sorting the points, and inserting them in that order, we avoid this problem of having to test if it's inside. Okay? And it turns out that it makes it very neat and efficient to, to, to build these things. Basically, the time complexity to build a convex hull depends just on the time to sort the points. Okay? And it's an example of, again, a more complicated problem from which, um, basically, sorting turns out to be the answer. Okay? The idea that we use to build something more complicated from. Any questions about that? Yes? Couldn't you decrease the area of your polygon by adding a point that's already inside? 
side? That's so, going to shrink the area? Well, what you're saying is that, it depends what you mean by a convex hull, okay? Actually, what, I, what you're saying is right. I just maybe didn't give you a complete definition. Um, you're saying, what if I had a po po polygon that looked like this, and um, then added a point, why couldn't I make it smaller by doing something like this? Is this what you're concerned with? Yeah, as long as it's still okay. the points. The reason, the reason is because it's something I just described. I actually want the smallest area a convex polygon. And a convex polygon doesn't have any of these divots. Gotcha. Okay, so, so that, that's the reason. Okay? But um, and it turns out the convex polygon is the right thing to think about for several reasons, which I don't really want to go into. But that's a good point. Question? Shouldn't you also sort the y coordinates to In the case of duplicates of the x? Turns out in this case, the question is, is should I sort the y coordinates? It turns out, again, the details of this algorithm, maybe I don't want to go into too much detail. Turns out you, you, you don't really have to sort the, 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 the y coordinates assuming that, all, that, that there's no points that share the same x-coordinate. Because all you want to do is to march, put the points in an order where you can insert them so you know that they're outside. That the next point you insert is already outside and to the right of everything you've seen. But can the, the inside the x interval but outside the y interval? Well, it could be. It could be. But then suppose let's say you're saying, what if we have a set of points that looks like this? Here's our current convex hull. Suppose we insert another point that's very, very high with the y. That would simply get edited in when we came up to its x-coordinate. If its x-coordinate, so long as its x-coordinate is to the right of everything we already have, it's going to be outside. Once it's outside, all we have to do is to go back and fi the, 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 the question that I'm not telling you how to do is how do you go back and figure out what changes you make. Okay, but that turns out to be fairly easy once you, you know, I, I could explain that in 15 minutes. Okay? Well, if it's not to the right, then we would have inserted it at a different point. You're saying, what if this point was really here? Yeah. Then we would have inserted it. He, oh, again, yeah, no, this is not really readable. Let's see if we can go to a different pen. We would have inserted this point. Let's say this was our original hull. We now insert a very high point. We would insert that now at the point where its x-coordinate suddenly became greater than anything we had seen before. So it doesn't really matter where the y-coordinate is in this case. The only important, the only thing we're relying on here is that we're inserting on a point that we know can't be inside what we've already done. And so long as it's to the right of, if you think about it, if, if I'm standing to the right of you, I am not, I'm not part of you. Okay, there's a, there's a line between us. And that's really what, what we're relying on the sorting for. It's simply to guarantee a separation so we know that the thing, point has to be outside. Okay? Again, the details of this you know, would need a little bit more explanation. But I want this as sort of a motivation that, again, the idea of sorting these things, sorting the points by their x-coordinate is a good first step in almost any geometric problem, okay? Because it just gives you a way to look at the points in an order that has some meaning. Okay, any questions about that? Okay? So the bottom line is that there's lots and lots of different applications for sorting, okay? And that's actually why we are mostly, as algorithms, people going to be caring about it. Okay, any further questions about this? So we've talked about why we want to sort, okay? But we didn't really describe how we're going to sort, okay? And this is where we start getting into the details of sorting algorithms in general. The simplest sorting algorithm, as far as I'm concerned, the one that if you gave me an hour to write a sorting program and you had a gun to my head to make sure that I did it, I would probably use selection sort. Because it's just sort of the simplest algorithm. It's the one that, that is, is sort of, you know, perfectly easy to understand. Suppose you want to sort n, item, n, you know, n items. What we're going to do, let's say we want to sort the numbers, um, you know, let's say uh, 10, 3, uh, 5, 1, 7. One thing that we can do is look through all the numbers, find out which one is smallest, and put that one first in, let's say, our array. Then go through all the remaining numbers. Find out which one is smallest. Yeah, 3 is now the smallest. Leave that where it is. Sweep through the remaining array. What is the smallest? Well, 5 is the smallest, so that's there. Sweep through the array. Which is the smallest one? 7 is the smallest one. 
Okay? Sweep through the smallest one, 10 is the smallest remaining one. Anything else? Well, there's nothing else in the array. So that's that. Okay? So selection sort basically simply goes through the thing, finds the smallest item, sticks that first, and repeats on the remaining items. Okay? Very, very simple sorting algorithm. The pseudocode of it is here. You have one loop, 4i goes to 1 to n, which tells you which element are you considering, the ith largest element. And then you sweep through everything that's remaining to find which one that actually is. So you've got two different loops. They nest. It should be clear that the time complexity of this thing is order n squared, at most n squared. Because you've got two loops, each of which run at most n times. And what they do in here is just do a test and maybe a swap, okay? both of which take constant time. So n squared suffices to do insertion to selection sort. Why is this algorithm correct? Well, this is one of these algorithms that I think it's pretty clear that it's correct. But if you want some kind of an argument, okay, the argument for why it's correct, the proof would be something like an inductive proof. We know that in the ith iteration, at the start of the ith iteration, all the numbers that are, that are the, the, the 0 through i minus first smallest numbers are all already in their proper position. We're now going to go find the smallest number that remains. This has to be okay, smaller than anything else in the array by definition. And it has to be bigger than anything we've seen before. So therefore, it's in its right spot. If the ith spot is numbers in the right spot, for all i from 1 to n, the thing's sorted. That's a proof of correctness. That shouldn't be too confusing. The other thing about selection sort that we should take a look at quickly, it should be very obvious that this is an order n squared algorithm, meaning it takes at most n squared time. But we really want to be precise with our analysis. Maybe the algorithm takes fast, could, could be faster than n squared. Okay? And we might be ignoring it because I'm saying, look, here I'm saying this goes from 1 to n, go from 1 to n. Okay? So maybe I'm being a little careless. Okay, But in fact, this algorithm really does take n squared time. And why is that? I guess my argument for why it would take n squared time is that we know that the first n over 2 iterations to find the, 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 the n over 2 largest numbers, in each one of these times, we're going to be comparing um, at least n over 2 other numbers to find what the largest one remaining is. Two iterations each of which is making at least n over 2 comparisons. The total number of comparisons being made is at least n over 2 times n over 2, or n squared over 4. So you know that, in fact, this algorithm not only runs an order n squared time, but it really, honest to God, does take n squared time. We have both upper and lower bounds on how much time it takes. And that's quadratic. So we know what this algorithm is going to do. Any questions about selection sort? Yes, it runs an n squared if it's already sorted. If you look at it, it's basically, I mean, and, and that should be pretty clear, because it's not doing anything to change the loop structure, depending upon what, what you actually give it. It's just blindly shuffling papers around, OK? And that, that's what it's doing. So it's n squared, OK, in the worst case, and n squared in the best case, and n squared on average. So this um, assumes that time units are taken for comparison, but not for solving. Well, this assumes that well, I'm counting a comparison as taking one time step, and a move is taking one time step. OK, sometimes people will say they count comparisons, and sometimes they count moves. In this case, let's, when I talk about the time complexity, really, I should be counting everything. OK, and so for all the algorithms we'll talk about here, I may say I'm counting comparisons. But if so, that's because the number of comparisons turns out to be greater than or equal to the number of moves. And so by counting the comparisons, that's big O the number of moves. OK, any questions about that? Yes? So four loops are always going to be the same. You can fix them, right? It's just the swap level. Right, so you say, what is the time complexity? If you're watching this program, what's going to happen? The time complexity of this thing is going to always be theta of n squared. How much time it took for you to actually do this thing? Okay. Actually, in this case, it's going to do the exact same thing regardless. It's going to take the, uh, 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 as far as I can tell, this will uh, actually, it's not completely. OK. So if we ever do a swap every time we do a comparison that turns out to be bad, there's going to be more swaps that happen if I guess the thing is in reverse order than if it was sorted. 
So if you watched it, it might take twice as long on a reversed ordered thing than on a sorted thing. But who cares? Big O of that, it's, it's the same thing. Okay? Because in this case, it, it happens to be doing swaps depending upon whenever it finds something that's out of order. Yes? Oh, okay, so you're saying what if I'm sorting all the integers where the integers happen to be for numbers 1 through n? Okay, if I was sorting numbers and I knew in advance that the numbers were exactly 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, dot, dot, dot. Then actually, I don't, if you think about it, I don't even have to sort them. I could just rewrite them with one do loop. Say 4i equals 1. So that's a very, very special input pattern you're talking about. Input pattern, I can play all kinds of tricks. Okay? The important thing about my algorithm, I want it to work for all kinds of data. Okay? And this thing will sort anything. You give this thing names, it'll sort it. You give this thing numbers, it'll sort it. Okay? It makes no assumption about the input. Good questions. Any other questions about selection sort? Okay? Again, simple, standard, dependable, but slow algorithm for sorting. How can we do better? Well, my favorite faster algorithm, okay, is based on a data structure called a binary heap. Okay? What is a binary heap? A heap is a binary tree structure where every node in the tree has a key associated with it. A key, I mean a data item. Okay? And it has the following properties. All the leaves are on at most Okay? All the trees in the lowest levels occur shoved over to the left as far as they can. Okay? And most important, okay, the key in the, um, at the root of every node is bigger than, okay, that or less than, it depends on which way you want to build your heap. Okay? But that, that there's an ordering property that the root is, has a key value that goes before any of its children. Okay? And that right subtrees are again heaps, meaning that for every node in this tree, it is bigger. It, 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 each the key associated with that node goes before that of all of its children, all of its descendants. Okay, so what is a heap? That is a heap. Okay, let's zoom in on this heap. Okay, this is a heap of dates. Okay, I have the dates of the certain dates of the year that have special meaning to certain people at uh, ordered uh, order depends upon their calendar date. So New Year's Day occurs before every other day of the year. Okay, if we look at that thing, July Fourth occurs before things in December or October. Groundhog Day occurs before Christmas. Okay. So this is, tree has the heap order. If we look at it, all the nodes in the tree, it's a perfectly balanced tree, and all the leaves are shoved as right most as they can. The three conditions of the heap that we specified, two of them describe the shape of the tree, saying the tree has to be neatly balanced and all the leaves shoved to the left. The last condition says, how do we label the keys? Okay? And that's really where the heap order comes from. Okay? So this is a heap. Okay? If, on the other hand, I change um, New Year's Day to Rosh Hashanah, that would be presumably something like, uh, I don't know when it is, let's say September um, 5th, that would not be a heap anymore. Because now there are things that are below that before, um, you know, it would violate the heap order. Okay, and if I were to decide that, let's say, Hanukkah, uh, a Halloween, shouldn't be a holiday, and deleted it, it wouldn't be a heap, because now I don't have all the leaves shoved to the left as most as possible. Okay. So, but basically, what I had before was indeed a heap. Any questions about that? Yes. So could very well be that was at the time. Yes. Be a three three, which is smaller than some above to the left node. Say that again. I'm sorry. You could have something on a low level which is actually bigger than a node, which is not really adjacent somewhere on the Right, so what, what was noticed here was that um, there is 
a lot of um, room for sort of playing around with these values, a lot of flexibility. So for example, what I could have done is I could have, to make this thing originally a heap, I could have put um, the, uh, if I'd wanted, I could have moved the uh, Halloween to this spot, slid July 4th down here, and moved um, Groundhog Day over here, and it would still satisfy the heap order. So there's lots of different ways that you could sort of satisfy the heap order. Okay? That's something that's true. Okay? But, but the heap order has to have this parents' children property. That's all that we demand of it. Okay? Any questions about heaps? Now, in, in sort of mathematical terms, what a heap does is this ancestor relation in a heap defines something called a partial order. Okay? And a partial order, as far as I'm concerned, is sort of a way to order things when you when it's not necessarily defined where the one thing is bigger than another thing. Okay? So when we talk about a partial order in mathematical terms, okay, we say that in a partial order is a relationship on elements where um, each element is considered to be an ancestor of itself. That's what we mean by reflexivity. We say that um, that um, it's, it's true that basically it's, it's not symmetric, that if I'm an ancestor of you, you can't be an ancestor of me. Okay? And it, it's sort of a transitive law that says that if I'm an ancestor of you and you are an ancestor of somebody else, then I'm an ancestor of that somebody else. These are the properties that we say partial orders satisfy. But basically what partial orders are, are they're hierarchies. They, 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 I, the way I like to think of them is they're hierarchies with incomplete information. Okay? So for example, if we go back to um, the heap hierarchy, if I give you a heap like this, and it's a valid heap, the fact that um, the New Year's is before um, is an ancestor of Halloween means that New Year's is before Halloween. The fact that we don't have any connection between Groundhog Day and July 4th means we don't care at this point which one is first. We don't have our calendar planned that far in advance. Okay? These things are sort of elements that are not related at this point. We don't know anything about their relation just by their structure in the tree. Okay? And that's what really a partial order is. A total order is when we have the items sorted and we say, yes, the ith item has to be bigger than the i minus first item. Okay? But in a partial order, we have a certain amount more flexibility. And this flexibility is important because it turns out to be easier to build a um, heap, which has a certain amount of order in it, than um, it is to actually build a total order, which involves sorting. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why we care about it. So heaps have the property that they're actually easier to build than to sort. Okay? And that's because the partial order that they demand is weaker. Okay. Any questions about partial orders or what they are or why? Okay. Very good. So how can we build a heap? Okay. One idea for how to build a heap is to insert items in incrementally. Okay. So I start out with a partial heap. And I then figure out where is if I want to add another item to my heap. I could do it by inserting it into the leftmost open slot. Okay? And if that element is greater than its parent, okay, we can swap positions and keep repeating. So going back again to our heap on the uh, calendar. Okay? Suppose I wanted to insert um, another holiday, okay, like let's say my birthday, okay, which happens to have been last okay, 1.30. Okay? What we could do is insert the node down here and then check to see how does this value compare to that of its parent. Okay? It, since it's in fact out of order, what I could do is relabel this with my birthday and relabel this with Groundhog Day. Okay? The important thing to see is now this particular node is happy because um, we just checked. It's now definitely less than what was before it. This particular subtree has to be by some value which was smaller than it. 
If it was happy before, and an earlier date is now there, it's certainly still later than, if it was later than all the date before, and replace it by an earlier date, okay, it's still going to be happy. The only person who may not be happy is my, 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 my ancestor. And so now I would compare, how does my date compare, this new date compare with my ancestor? If it's out of order, I'll it up again. If it's in order, okay, I will leave it where it is. And this is a correct way to maintain the heap property. Okay? Namely, if I want to insert something, find the first open slot governed by the shape of the tray. Stick the item in there and then percolate it up until it finds its natural level. Okay? Any questions about that procedure? Okay? How much time should that algorithm take? Okay? Suppose I insert an item into a heap whose height happens to be h. How much time might that algorithm take? Okay. Any questions? Any ideas? Okay. Yes. Something between n and n log n. Well, suppose I have a heap whose height happens to be h. And it's got n. Okay. The the time it's going to take is going to depend upon what the height of the heap is. At each step, I'm going to insert that node. I'm going to say, hey, dad, OK? Am I bigger than you or not? If so, I'll swap and go up to grandpa. OK, go up to the great grandpa, dot, dot, dot. The height is going to tell me how many ancestors I possibly have. I can't swap beyond my furthest ancestor. So the number of steps it'll take to insert an item is going to be proportional to the OK? I'm going to do a constant amount of stuff Namely, look at two items and do a swap, possibly for each item level in the heap. So if my heap has h levels, okay, it will take at most order h time. Now, suppose I have a heap with h levels. How many nodes might be in a heap of h levels? Okay. Nodes might be in a heap of height h. Well, let's start and think about it, OK? If I start out with one item and I build a full heap on it, OK, I get two. If I now build a heap of, of, of the next level, I double the number of nodes. Each level I build doubles the number of nodes. My claim is the number of nodes I can have in a heap of roughly. 2 to the h, OK? Maybe it's plus, minus. Okay? That, that level you have to sit down and think about, OK? But the gut feeling should be, look, every time I add another level to the heap, I can double the amount of stuff I stick into it, OK? That's why the, the definition of the heap was so demanding, OK? It wanted this nice balanced tray so that I could guarantee that if I have a heap of height h, I could fit 2 to the h things in it, which meant that the height of the heap is growing logarithmic in the total amount of stuff that I put into it, the total number of nodes. So if I have n nodes in a heap, the height of the heap is going to be at most log n. Okay? By the same reason why any one of these doubling processes, the relationship between n and log n. Okay? So we know that for each insertion in the heap, if I have n items, the height is going to be at most a log n. Each insertion is going to take at most log n time. By doing this bottom-up insertion procedure, what I'm guaranteed is that by doing n such insertions, it's going to take at most, OK, and in fact, it takes exactly n log n time, OK? Because I'm doing n operations, each operation which takes at most time proportional to the height of the heap, OK, each of which, in fact, be log n if I have n items. OK? Any questions at this point? I can see some puzzled faces. OK? There are two things that we've sort of sh shown. The first issue is, given a heap, we can insert a new item into a heap by the bottom-up process. And the time it takes will be proportional to the height of the heap. 
How many people believe that? Okay, a bunch of people. How many people don't believe that? Okay. What is then, what is the time that this takes? Well, the time it takes is proportional to the height of the heap. And if you've got n items, the heap has a height of at most log n. How many people believe that? Okay, a bunch of people. How many people don't believe that? Okay, no one will admit to it. Okay, although I do have a suspicion that some people don't. Okay, but if we believe that, we can build a heap in n log n time. Okay, using the bottom-up process. And that should be pretty obvious. Turns out there's actually a better way to build a heap, okay, which I'd like to kind of go into, which is really a very slick thing. And it's going to be an example of when you do careful analysis that you can really, you know, really get some kind of amazing results from um, analyzing algorithms more carefully. So what is the um, way that we're going to be merging, the, uh, building these heaps? Instead of building from a bottom up where we insert things one by one, what we're going to use is a merging based procedure. Okay? Where what we're going to do is, suppose that I'm giving two heaps and a fresh element. What I'm going to do is make a heap by sticking the, uh, build a heap so let's say I have um, a heap here and a heap here. These are both properly. I'm now going to add another element. Start it out as the root of this heap. The way that I'm going to could build a heap is take two smaller heaps, insert another item not at the bottom, but at the root of these new two smaller heaps. And instead of percolating down, up from the bottom and growing up towards the top like I did before, I could have the root element find its proper by starting from the top and percolating down. So suppose I want the smallest number on top. Suppose the root of this thing happens to be 100. Suppose the root of this thing happens to be 50. And the root of this thing happens to be 75. How could I build a heap out of this thing? Okay? The 100 doesn't belong, okay, because we want the smallest number on top. How could we get the smallest number on top? Keep swapping with the smaller of the two children. Look at the two children, that's right, look at the two children saying, well, look, this is a heap, that's a heap, okay? If I put the 100 down here, if I swap this, This item, because it's the smaller of this and this, this item has to be the smallest of everything else because this was before. So this guy was happy. Every element here was happy with 75 as its root. If I give it a smaller ancestor, it's still going to be happy. This item, the 100 here, is not necessarily in its proper position. Because there may be other things that are smaller than it down there. But again, by looking at the two children that we have, okay, and seeing which one of them is bigger, it's smaller, and putting that as the root. Each level of the heap, we can do a constant amount of work. Look at two items, pick the small three items, look at pick the smallest, and then swap appropriately. Do that at each level of the heap. Okay? My claim is that in time proportional to the height of the heap, we can do this merging step. OK? Any questions about that? Yes? Do the two heaps you're putting together have to be the same size? The two heaps, well, that's a good question. On which pr the question was, do the two heaps have to be the same size? Well, there's three different heap properties. One property is a question to make sure that, they, that, that you have the parent order satisfied that everything is bigger than everything below it. And for that, it really wouldn't matter what the size of the heaps are. It just matters that they be ordered. However, if you want to keep the heaps balanced in shape to satisfy the shape properties, then in fact, the heaps have to be the perfect shapes to permit this kind of merging. Okay? So that's where the shape would come in, okay? is, is, is to affect the, um, make sure that the shape of what you get is going to be a heap. Okay? With this case, when we do this merging, the shape that we're going to get in each of these subheaps 
is exactly the shape that they started with. So if they were proper shape before, they'll be proper shape now. Any other questions about this? OK. So what is the algorithm? Well, the algorithm in pseudocode is basically to build a heap is something like, or to do the insertion is this. We take a look at what our two children are, find the smallest one, insert it, and then swap, and then go back and recur on it. OK? Again, I don't want to, the, the pseudocode's probably more confusing than the idea. So I don't want to go in it. So what could we do? We could use heapify to build a heap the way that um, this kind of trickle-down algorithm, the same way the trickle-up algorithm did, by one by one going through our items and inserting them into a heap. Suppose we have a heap that looks something like this. I hope this is going to be visible here. Okay. One thing that we can do is start out with a, a array of items, stick them in a tree shape, the proper heap shape, without regard to labels at first. Okay? And then go back and try to clean up what the labels are. So what we could do now is we have our items in a tray. We want, in this particular example, the largest item to be the root of the, um, the, the letter last in the alphabet to be our root, ultimately. What we could now do is say, look, every one element subtray is by definition a heap. We could now go through this process of merging, of expanding, um, what do I want to do? Saying, let's look through these things and say, let's look at the ancestor. Is n after the alphabet, then L and E? The answer is yes, it is. Okay. Is P sub I less than this? The answer is yes, it is. P less than M and I, the answer greater than M and I, yes, it is. Is T less than um, X and A? I mean, is, is, X, is T the biggest of X and A? No. We can now take the heap that started with X and the heap that started with A, merge them with T to put X on top. OK? Now we know that all of these things are proper heaps. Go back here and check. Is R bigger than any of these things? Yes. Is O bigger than any of these things? No. So we're now going to want to percolate O down. And O would go down the P side. OK. Is O bigger than M and I? Yeah, that's happy to be stopped. Is S bigger than X or R? No. Find the biggest one. Well, X is the biggest one. OK. So X should become the root. S should slide down. Is S bigger than T and A? No. So T should slide down into that position. OK. And finally, repeating it again, we would now ask, is X bigger than, is A bigger than X and P? No. Again, inserting, the, swapping the X with the A and percolating the A down. We end up getting a perfectly valid heap, OK, from a result of these repeated merge operations. So what's the point of all this? My claim is I can build a heap in an incremental way two different ways. One way was by doing these insertion operations that I talked about before, triple up. The other way is by doing these merge down operations. Start from the root and percolate down. Both of these, I have n operations. Both of these, the time the operation takes is height of the, the tray. Both cases, the height of the heap is at most log n. So both of these operations to build a heap should, by this course analysis, take n log n time each. OK? How many, OK, are there questions? I see some puzzled looks. Yeah, you said both have really n operations. n or n over 2 operations. Yeah. OK? So what are we going to be doing here? We have two possible ways now of building a heap. One is by inserting from the bottom and percolating up. That we showed took n log n time. The other one of which I said we could just sort of start from the roots of these heaps and percolate down. And that by doing n or n over 2 operations, each of which takes time proportional to the height of the heaps that we're merging. OK? If you want to do a cursory analysis, you can say that no heap that we're merging 
ever is a type more than log n. Therefore, each one of the merge steps takes log n time. n over 2 merge steps times log n gives us an n log n algorithm. So that would seem that both of these two algorithms are, in fact, um, n log n. OK? Question? Yes. Uh, what about the overhead of creating the uh, second uh, The second what? The second heap. In other words, it, in one instance, we're dealing with a single heap. In the other instance, we have to start out with two heaps. Well, okay, the, question is, well, the question was something about an overhead of starting out with two heaps. The important thing to see is that, in fact, we're starting out when you have two singleton elements. A singleton element by itself okay, is a heap. So there's no overhead with starting out with building the first heap on three elements. Okay? And so there's a certain amount of maybe constant overhead. You're juggling pointers or something like that. That we don't worry about. But what we're now given are two different operations, both of which will build heaps, both of which seem like they should take n log n time, because it would seem like to actually build a heap. Okay? Each operation, the, the biggest heap operation, Okay, takes time proportional to the height of its heap. But let's look more closely at the heapify operation and how much time that it's taking. What did heapify do? Again, we started out with we had our, built our original heap structure based on um, not having any, um, you know, didn't worry about the labels. We then went through and marched down and said, look, let's look at starting at the second level saying, are you bigger than that? If so, merge. Are you bigger than that? If so, merge. Are you bigger than that? If so, merge. 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 OK? That's why we have n over 2 operations. Each operation might take time proportional to the height of the heap. OK? That's why n log n looks like the right answer to how much time it takes to build a heap like this. But let's look at that operation. First of all, any questions about this? OK, before we get any further. I'm afraid I have some confused faces here. OK. Does everybody, how many people here believe that n log n is an upper bound for building the, take the time it takes to build a heap using these merge operations? OK, a lot of people believe that. OK, that's good. But does it really take n log n time? OK, if I go to the store and you know, I, I, I buy 100 items, Okay, and the most expensive item I spent was $1,000. Did I spend $100,000 at the store? The answer is not necessarily. I may have bought that one item and, and, and 99 sticks of gum. Okay. In fact, that's exactly what's happening at, um, when, we, when we actually look at what's happening with Heapify. It's true that the final merge operation, where we merge the root of this thing with these two almost full heaps, could require bopping down every single level. But most of the operations that we're doing are, in fact, relatively cheap operations. It costs us nothing to build heaps out of these first n over 2 things. They're heaps when we first looked at them. Starting a merge from here, well, here we have n over 4 items. Each of these n over 4 items defines a heap of height 1. So how much time does that take to actually do a merge? Well, each one of those items takes only one step. Here we've got n over four items, okay? each of which takes a, height of, a, a merge step of two. And at each step as we move through this thing, okay, as we move higher and higher up the heap, yes, the operations are getting more expensive. But also, yes, they're getting to be a lot fewer of them. So we've got a trade-off. okay? And that maybe by counting these things more carefully, we can in fact show that there is a um, le takes less time than the very coarse analysis that we did, simply taking the most expensive operation and counting at times the number of operations. So let's count a little bit more carefully what really is the cost of building a heap. Okay. If we have a heap with n nodes in it, okay. There are going to be, at most, n over 2 to the h plus 1 nodes at a particular height of h in the heap. Well, why is that? Well, let's just see if that makes sense. Suppose the height of the heap was log n. 
Okay, that would mean that there was, we were talking about a node that was really high at the root. What is 2 to the log n? Okay, this is something you have to know. What is 2 to the log n? n. Okay, what is n over n? 1. That says that there is one node that is very at height 1. How many nodes are there that are at height, uh, that are at height log n? How many nodes are there that are at height 0? Okay. N over 2. And sure enough, if you take a look at that, that's exactly what we get here. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 out of 15. 15 over 8 is 2. Okay? Plus or minus. Okay? So the important thing to see here is if you look at this thing, and it should make sense, as we move through the heap, at each level, as we march up the heap, the number of nodes that, get, that we have gets cut by half. Okay? So in general, there are n over 2 to the h, or h plus 1, nodes at that height. For each one of these nodes, the amount of time we spend doing that merge, the heapify operation, the merge operation at that point, okay, ends up costing us height h. Okay? And the good thing about that is, so basically we've got a summation where we're summing up as h goes from 0 to log n, because that's the maximum height in the heap. For every node, we count, we count every node once by counting up how many times it occur, each node, how many nodes there are at each level. So every node gets counted once. And for each one, we pay a cost of h. So what is this time? Well, we can replace that order h by some constant times h. That's really what the upper bound is. So this really is going to be a sum that goes from 0 to log n of h over 2 to the h. OK? Suppose we had a sum that looked like this. It went the sum as h goes from 1 to log n of 1 over 2 to the h. What would that be? It's 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus what is that going to be? Okay. It's a geometric series. Okay. A geometric series is something that converges. So the sum of 1 over 1, one half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus that is going to be maybe it's 2, maybe it's 4. I don't remember these things. I don't have to remember these things. It's going to be a constant. Okay, in fact, it's going to be 1. I do remember that. Okay? But the important thing is that if you have a geometric series, it converges. So the sum of 1 over 2 to the h, as we sum from 0 to infinity, or 0 to anything, is going to be at most 1, or 2, or 3. It's a constant. So when we look at that, we really would have a constant times n. That would show that, in fact, to build the heap, the total time to build the heap is, in fact, linear. OK? Because if you look at it, the, the worst case is really not occurring very much. The amount of time that the worst case contributes is negligible contained compared to the small cases. OK? And the small cases, the sum of that turns out to be linear. OK? Any questions about this? OK? I pulled one little fast one, OK? Because if you took a look at the original sum, the sum said that was h over 2 to the h. And I had told you that we were talking about a geometric series that was summing 1 over 2 to the h. h over 2 to the h presumably is a bigger series. So maybe that sum is, in fact, not a constant, OK? But if you stop and think about it, 2 to the h is growing very large. That's growing exponentially. h is growing 1, 2, 3, 4. This is going to be adding up very, very small fractions very, very quickly. Okay? If you believe that 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth converges, okay, you should be able to believe that, in fact, having the h there converges. Okay? If you don't believe it, I'll prove it for you in a second. Okay, but the intuition should be clear. 
You've got a series where you're summing up fractions that are growing down geometrically, getting to zero so quickly that the sum of these things is, in fact, turns out to be um, a constant. Yes, question. OK. What's the proof of convergence? Well, I don't really want to go into this too much carefully, just so you know that I'm not lying. OK. That, um, in fact, we know that uh, the closed form that we've been using all over the place, the sum of a geometric series, the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity of x to the k for a small enough value of x, okay, something an x that's, that's less than 1, okay, turns out to be 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, this is something that everybody should, should, should know or believe. Okay? How do you get the more general thing? Well, if you take the derivative of both sides, you get an expression that looks like this. Okay? And if you now take that, um, you multiply both sides by x, you end up getting an expression that looks exactly like what we want. Okay? And so, in fact, this proof, I don't want to go into the details, but in fact, the, the general sum converges. Okay? But the way that I would theorize that the sum converges is by knowing that the geometric series converges and seeing that you've just got this piddly amount that you're adding to it. Okay? And that isn't going to help you. Okay? So what is the lesson? The primary lesson of heap sort, okay, okay, or the, what we've analyzed done so far, is that if you want to do an analysis, okay, sometimes when you do a course analysis of a problem or an algorithm, you'll find that, um, in fact, the algorithm could be faster than you say it is. Okay? Usually when we analyze algorithms, the, the easy way to go is say you're doing at most this many operations at most that much time. This is the total amount of time. Okay? However, if we find that we're overestimating too much, being too sloppy, <coughs> sometimes there's a much better time bound. The real reality is better than our worst case estimate. And if so, we should exploit that. Okay? One last thing. I started off talking today about this as being a way of doing sorting. Okay? Sorting is, was the motivation for talking about heaps. Okay? The reason why we can use heap sort okay, to sort is as follows. If you take a look at a heap, the smallest element is on the top of the heap. That much is clear. The smallest element is the first thing in sorted order. If we could delete the top element from the heap, okay, store that someplace as the first thing in sorted order, then rebuild this heap, the smallest remaining item is going to be on top. Okay? If we pull that one off, stick that in our array, repercolate up the heap, at each point we're going to be pulling off the smallest remaining item. Okay? And so the time it's going to take to do this sorting is the time it took to build the heap, which was linear, times the time it takes to actually delete the first element and repercolate. Well, the percolation may require time proportional to the height of the heap. The height of the heap is at most log n. In fact, building a heap gives you an algorithm that takes at most n log n time. Okay? And that's heap sort. And next class, we'll start to talk a little bit more about it and what the consequences are. Any questions before people run? Okay, thanks for your attention. See you next class.